we have a special double guest episode featuring two prominent figures in AppSec. First, we have Jay Bobo, a cybersecurity leader, entrepreneur, and the driving force behind product security engineering at Cover My Meds. He's also the founder of Breach Siren, a cutting edge data breach intelligence startup. Joining Jay is Darylin Ross, a senior application security engineer at Cover My Meds. With a career spanning roles at EDS, Verizon Wireless, and Chipotle's security operations team, Darylin brings a wealth of knowledge. She's a staunch advocate for fostering a security first culture through relationship building and mentoring. We'll dive deep into the provocative topic, AppSec is dead. We'll explore the nuances between product and application security, and we'll discuss the importance of building solid relationships within the engineering organization and delve into the intricacies of communicating vulnerabilities to senior leaders and engineers. So buckle up for an engaging and insightful conversation with Jay and Daryl Lynn as we navigate the ever-evolving application security landscape. Keep security top of mind with continuous application security training for your developers. Security Journey offers bite-sized lessons with hands-on interactive training for all roles in the SDLC. Give your admins the ability to use pre-built or custom training paths with easy-to-use tracking and reporting. Visit securityjourney.com to see our solution today. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Application Security Podcast. This is Chris Romeo. I am a co-host of the podcast, but I am flying solo on this mission today. Uh, I'm the CEO of DaVinci. I'm also a general partner at Curve Ventures, and I've been in the world of security for what feels like hundreds of years. Uh, I'm super excited to be joined today by Darylin and Jay. And so we're going to do security origin stories, folks. Like we have to start there. Our, our audience always wants to know from where you're coming. Where? How did you get into this industry? How did you find your way here? And so, Daryl, why don't you go ahead and uh, and kick us off from that perspective and share your superhero origin story? Sure. Well, I never intended to be in security, so it's kind of interesting. I was a developer for a good twenty five years. Um, Finally wanted to maybe change and do something else. So I moved over to more of us infrastructure support team. Two weeks after I started, they all got laid off. And the director called me up and said, I want you to do security for my org because I we're getting killed on this. I'm like, I don't know anything about that. You know, he's like, well, you better learn it because this is your new job. And I've been in security ever since. Uh, he was right. It was a good match and I uh, really enjoy it. Okay. Very cool. All right, Jay, how about you? How, what's your security origin story? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I actually wanted to be in security or something security related. I was 10 years old when Sneakers, the movie came out. Robert Redford, Sidney Poitier, you know, and we, I grew up in the inner city. We were one of the few families that actually had like a computer. My dad didn't understand. He was like, hey, here it is. Go do something with it. So that's kind of what started me there. But I was always into, you know, the hacking movies and Dick Tracy. And from there, I got into, you know, uh, to my parents' chagrin, you know, war dialers and rats and all types of fun stuff. Um, the days of, of bulletin board systems and stuff like that. Um, but I ended up getting into sports and entertainment and the ad agency world and it ended up coming back to it much later in my career and starting off um, in application security after being a software developer for about 15 years. Um, so that's kind of how I got pulled back into it. It's always something that I wanted to do, but you know, I let mu music and having a good time in my twenties sort of pulled me in a different direction. Then I came back home. So that's okay. my word. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's cool that you're both coming to application security from the world of development, having spent time, in the trenches as developers, because I find that those are the people that are the most in tune with the impact of what we do. Like when we add a new tool, those that have been developers before are processing it through the eyes of how, how is our group going to, how, how are other developers going to be impacted by this? How are they, what's going to be their response and their feelings about it? So, yeah. all right. So we should, we should dump, jump into this particular, 
particular topic, which is it's it's very non controversial. Um, but I, you know, we're 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 fine in the AppSec podcast of uh, of pushing the envelope a little bit. So the primary topic that you uh, that you shared with us is quite aggressive, and that is the concept that AppSec is dead. And so, yeah. Darlin, I want to I want to let you kick this off for us. Give us some context and some perspective on why you think AppSec is dead. Well, in our world today, really, we have to look at the whole product. And looking at the whole product is a lot more than AppSec. So AppSec is a little part of product security, right? And it's not the most important part of product security. Now, I'm an AppSec engineer, so I'm kind of kicking myself here. But... um when we look at what goes on in our world today and where we're being attacked, how we're being attacked, it is our product that is being attacked. Application security is part of that product security, but there has to be a whole culture around our security programs. And you can't do that with just AppSec, right? To get that whole culture, you need to promote product security buy-in from your executives, buy-in from your product people, buy-in from your engineering directors and managers, buy-in from your developers, and then buy-in from all those other people that surround you, right? So that's why we use product security. Um, I don't know, Jay, if you wanna fill in some other things, I could talk on this for a long time, but I wanna give you a chance too. Yeah, I think it's really important, and those are really good good points. I think it's important for us to shout out Justin Collins, the author of Breakman and head of security. I think he's still over at Gusto. He had a uh, talk mm, probably a couple of years ago um, at local MoCoSec, and his talk was AppSec is dead. He really sort of focused on it not scaling well, right? This idea of having these small sort of application security teams, and they're outnumbered and they're outgunned by developers and other sorts of engineers. Right. And they're having these sort of conversations just about sort of application security. It's like, how am I supposed to go through and I'm involved in pen testing? Am I supposed to sit down and do code review for everybody? You know, am I supposed to go through and do all these various things, you know, in addition to implementation of tools? Right. It's it's so that's that's one piece of why application security doesn't work. And then the other piece, I think, is getting back to what Daryl Lynn says. We need to utilize a systems thinking approach. Right. As opposed to little local optimizations and application or applications and APIs and so on and so forth. They're just components of a product. And when we kind of just focus on those things, we don't have an opportunity to kind of pull all that stuff together and give leadership an opportunity to say, hey, here are the technical risks to your revenue generating products, right? And maybe even products that don't generate any revenue. Um, and so just kind of really thinking more holistically about, hey, what is it that impacts the company? What is it that product owners want to know about? Um, a good example is you hear developers say all the time, Hey, I love to work on this thing, but the business wants me to do something else, right? My product owner wants me to do something else. You can sit down and have a conversation with the product owner about applications and watch their eyes sort of gloss over. You can have a conversation with them about products. They understand products. The business understands products. So when we talk about sort of moving security left and having, you know, really focusing on people, we need to speak in the language of the business and speak in the language of people. And everybody collectively understands what a product is and the importance of products. And that also allows us to, get to really think about sort of DevOps, sec, you know, a DevSecOps as well, right? What are the other pieces of this besides, you know, just, you know, fast and pen tests and DAS and SCA and so on and so forth. So um, it's, it's really sort of thinking more about the system as a whole, right? And sort of how the company operates as opposed to just sort of local optimization, just focus on a product. I mean, I want to just on an application, which is, I think, one of the, the big faults often of a, the traditional application security, um, you know, paradigm. So the longer I've been around AppSec and, and worked inside of companies that had developers and, and sat as a member of the security team, the more I see a future where, whether we call it AppSec or ProdSec, it, it feels like this function needs to be integrated inside of development. Like it feels like a, a, a future state that we should be aiming for is we don't have an AppSec team. We don't have a ProdSec team. We have a development team. And the development team 
has people that are part of that team that are dedicated security people, perhaps, but they don't sit in some other organization through some other channel. They share a management structure. They share a uh, organizational hierarchy that leads to the CTO and not to the CISO. It just seems like that would get us better results. What, what are, what's your reaction? Both of you, well, like either anybody can jump in on this one. Like what's your reaction though, to that kind of idea? Is that, does that make sense from what you've seen? Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, my personal opinion is that there, there are those opportunities that exist, but it, it, that comes down to sort of sort of resources as well. I think, a good way to think about it is what is the role of your security champions? I mean, a lot of organizations, security champions are just sort of people who have interest in security, but they don't really necessarily have any real work to do. And so I think that when we think about them as more sort of like, um, you know, people who have a actual responsibility to get into some of those things, right? They're almost, they're part of the security team, but they're embedded. They still have development work. And I think there's that opportunity to sort of grow in that particular direction as well. Is it, is it a possibility that your company says, hey, we want to make sure that all of our teams, product teams are fully, um, you know, cross-disciplinary and they have all the various roles that they need to sort of operate in these sort of like independent silos? Possibly. But that thing that really comes down to is your company willing to make that sort of investment. So I think it's going to need to be a little bit of a back and forth, right? You're going to need to have a uh, independent, uh, you know, group that is there supporting that uh, those product teams and helping them and, and consulting, you know, uh, they're in, in that capacity while also I think having the same thing, what you're saying is like, we need to educate people on, on, on those teams to uh, we need to be able to do both, right. And having a hybrid approach. I don't think it's like a, you know, it's not, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not a binary sort of situation. I think what we need to look at, look at more sort of what's the right balance and how do we have sort of a hybrid system that, allows us to move at the speed that the organization wants to move at. But that's my opinion. Darylin, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I would go right back to our security champions. We have, I would put my group of security champions against anybody. They're, they're great. They, um, they don't have the education that I do in AppSec, but they are very passionate about security. So where we get the win is because I have this really great group of security champions. The problem I see with embedding in development teams a security person is there aren't enough of us. I mean, I know in the whole industry there aren't enough security people, but truly AppSec engineers, there really aren't enough of us. Um, so I think that's one of the shortfalls in trying to embed us into development teams like that. Um, and then once we're there, there are a lot of things I do that I think are really important for our product security that I probably would be limited on if I were sitting in a dev team. So I think you just have to work out the model. I think that you're right, Chris, we're gonna have to be closer and closer and closer to engineering teams, but we also, um, have to have the influence across the entire organization. So I think you're always going to have some kind of security group to have that level of influence. Um, we do that with a security community of practice. We do it with our security working group. We do it with just one-on-one um, -on -one meetings and things that, you know, we do very intentionally to get that culture. So I, I feel like if you lose the security group, you lose a little bit of that and that's going to hurt you. Yeah, there certainly would still be a problem with governance <laughs> because the the development team with its, with security contained within is not going to govern themselves at this with the same rigor that a, that an outside group. So that's one of the arguments for yeah. keeping security separately is that we need a uh, a governance structure to drive it. And I'm a giant champions proponent. I mean, I wrote a whole framework on building security champions programs, but I really see this kind of evolution as I think it will play out as a top of the top tier kind of answer and security champions is that that'll be the state where people will start to get to 
is they will start to add those security resources. And I don't think it's even embedding. I think if we think of it as embedding, we're still thinking about a central security team that's deploying people into various development teams, keeping the, the, the holding the rope kind of back to a group in, in, in a central security team. And I think that's a, I think this is in, in five to 10 years, this is how, t- how organizations are going to mature. Um, and I, I can't wait to see how, how it, how it plays out uh, in, in kind of the way that uh, the way that organizations mature and, and grow in this. And there'll always be some organizations that are way behind. Like even if the top, even if Netflix, for example, who always, and, and Etsy, they always seem to lead. Everybody's always like, oh, they're at the bleeding edge of whatever's happening in anything. Like even if they went to no AppSec team and having security people deployed across, it would still be 20 years before everybody caught up to that model. I'll be long retired from this industry by the time everybody catches up and, and figures out how to, how to address this, this kind of style or approach. Yeah, I think it's also really interesting, Chris, too, is like, what is the right ratio as well, right? So if you move to that model, then how many security people need to be on a team, right? I think this is one of the points that Justin was attempting to make. Okay, well, what is the right? It's kind of like, you know, when you send your kid to school, it's like how, how many students, right, or in the classroom, how many teachers? And you're going to need that. And it also requires, you know, someone to, to Daryl Lynn's point, to have a lot more experience and also have a much more varied skill set. So, you know, and and also possibly to have less coaching. What we've seen is that that and when that when you have the wrong sort of ratio, even with security champions and they have a lot of work to do for us because they have real work to do and they actually have real power within our organization to dictate sort of when certain security initiatives happen. It leads to burnout. And I've seen it happen again and again with security champions. Like I'm completely burnt out. I'm doing development work and I'm also participating in vulnerability management talks and I'm participating in code review, you know, in addition with the, you know, helping out with the application security team, you know, at times, all these various sort of things are like, hey, I can't, I can't do this, you know, anymore. Um, and I, I've seen that happen a couple of times. So I think it really comes down to, again, focusing on people and having, and communicating about sort of how things are happening, what's the right right thing for everyone. I'm not sure necessarily whether our particular structure works for every organization, you know, but we have to optimize for people. And that's what we really try to do. We try to optimize mm-hmm. for people and for- That's a good for, statement. I'm going to borrow that one. Optimize for people. I'll, I'll give you attribution the first two times I use it. <laughs> by the third time, it's mine. But like optimize for the people though. But that's that's a good, because like one of the, one of the, the dark sides, I guess, of champions- and nobody ever does a talk about this is what you were talking about burnout um, environments where there's tension between management manager and champion and security team. It's like a, a tension triangle almost because the the champion is like, I kind of like security. I want to spend more time on it. The manager saying, no, you need to go build features because that's what I'm, my, my charter is. And you as the security team, you're trying to support the champion and, and help the, the manager. That's, that's a, that's a dark side of champions that we never talk about is that that ends up in burnout, ends up in people having stressful job worlds because there's, they're, they're, they're fighting with everybody pretty much because they, 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 they want to work with the security team, but the manager wants has, as you could expect. I mean, we already talked about business goals and stuff. The manager has, things that they need to achieve or the manager gets fired. Like it's a, it's yeah, it's just a, a slippery slope, I guess. Yeah. I think it's different for us because one, we are in a regulated environment, right? You know, so we're healthcare security, which is a completely different situation than let's say if you're some company that has some sort of like Twitter for dogs, you know, sort of app or something like that. Right. So when we take things very seriously around sort of PHI and, you know, protecting patients and so on and so forth. So for us, it's interesting that our, you know, um, engineering leaders really at the director level are the ones who go through and night with their engineering managers who their security champions are. So there's less conflict on our side because they're a part of the conversation early on. They recognize that they're responsible for keeping an eye on that risk and communicating that risk to their product leaders. We also have some of those conversations as well. So we, we experience less conflict there. It's more of a situation of which maybe a team is unbalanced and doesn't have enough security champions or maybe for some reason they have, let's say, a good amount of risk on a particular team, more applications, as an example, more developers, and that person is saying, okay, I'm, 
I'm doing a lot here, especially if in that case, maybe the security champion themselves isn't a developer, right? So our security champions are also database administrators, they're SREs, because our focus is on a product as a whole. So all of these various sort of groups and roles, you know, who are building out these assets and components that make up that product have to be a part of the conversation. So, you know, that's kind of maybe how we're different. And I've noticed that a lot of other security programs or security champion programs are that's kind of maybe where they're different than than mm-hmm. us. It's kind of really a focus on developers and that's not that's not you know, that's that's not everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's uh a good perspective and we need to have a follow on startup conversation, by the way, Twitter for dogs. Are you kidding me? Like what happens? The dog barks and that makes a tweet or a woof or, I mean, I guess that's already been, woof's already been used before, but like, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's probably a $25 idea. Like we could probably make 25 bucks if we started Twitter for dogs. All right. So Daryl, you got to help me understand the difference between prod sec or product security and application security in, in the, the environment that we've just been describing here. Cause we filled in a lot of details and context. Cause I kind of jumped around a little bit, but it's good. Cause now we, we have a better perspective on your organization and kind of the way your, how your program is fitting together. And, and I'm, I'm already getting an idea about what the difference is, but help let's address this one head on. So prod sec versus app sec, what's the difference? Um, I think where it really comes like rubber meets the road in our organization is that we have to have buy-in. Like Jay was talking about, we're highly regulated, right? We have a ton of PHI. We have to have the buy-in of those product people. They really don't know anything about my SaaS scans, right? That's AppSec. They really don't know anything about... um, some of the other work we do, pen testing on our apps, those kind of things for our truly pure app sec work. But what they do know is we make them come to our HIPAA technical risk assessments and go through a threat model with us and go through a gap assessment with us and say, listen, we have really valuable, important data we're protecting here. Are there any gaps? Do we have this control in place? Do we have this control in place? And they actually have to like um, understand enough of that to be part of the conversation. So I think that's one of the big things about um, where we are and uh, the way that we handle product security versus AppSec. AppSec is a little piece of the overall picture. Even for me as the senior AppSec engineer, I'm working in product sec a lot more than I'm doing some of those very specific AppSec roles. So, um, and that's just, that's one example, but you know, we're working with engineering directors, trying to get them to understand these are the vulnerabilities you have. This is your mean time to remediation. I'm not trying to shame you with this number. I'm trying to tell you, you might have a problem here because there's a gap. And for an engineering director, that's not, that's his product, right? That's what he's trying to build. It's not AppSec. That is one of the things that we are doing as an overall culture and it's bigger than AppSec. So your HIPAA kind of risk assessment process is at the product level. And so do you consider risk analysis, risk mitigation, threat modeling to be a product security capability versus an AppSec capability? See, I always... I always lump it, threat modeling just into the AppSec world because it just makes sense. But a lot of times I would say in my mind, I think of AppSec and product security slightly as a syn- of synonyms of each other. It's not exactly a perfect match, but I kind of put them, I just lump them together. And because I spent 11 years at Cisco and at Cisco, we did product security, right? Because we were building metal boxes, <laughs> we were writing software and firmware for metal boxes, but the metal box was kind of the beginning of the conversation, which you can't do AppSec against that metal box. And so we were doing product security, but we were integrating a lot of AppSec things and we were just calling it product security. 
Um, it wasn't yeah, until I left Cisco that I started referring to myself as an AppSec person. And it's it's interesting because my thought process when you were asking that question was, well, threat modeling is an AppSec tool. That doesn't mean you can't use it in product security. It's just a tool that we're using. Can, can people who are not developers contribute to a threat model? Of course, right? They know things. They're thinking about things differently. So that's awesome because threat modeling is just brainstorming. So now you have another perspective in the room. You have another opinion. You have another person looking at it a different way. So you're using an AppSec tool more broadly. Um, and you're right. We we toss product and AppSec around a lot. They are interchangeable in a lot of circumstances. But I think where you get the difference is the culture piece. The overall, um, I've read before, AppSec is baking a cake. ProdSec is like making sure the whole bakery works. You know, it's the it's a little piece of the overall picture. And I can't tell you where I read that or attribute it to somebody, but that is somebody else's analogy. <laughs> but you I've know, I've heard it's, that too. I can't remember. I can't remember the attribution either. Yeah, I don't know who said it, but they're right. So we take some of these AppSec tools that we've developed and we do like spread them across into other disciplines and get those people's input. Um, same way, we take some AppSec concepts and we teach them to people who aren't developers or security engineers, right? We have a security community practice where we talk about security things. And part of our goal there is to teach the whole organization about security concepts. So it's a culture thing. Again, that's product security. That's not app security. That's product security. Hmm. So do you insulate your development teams from SaaS tools, results from SaaS, or, or do you somehow feed them results from SaaS tools without them running the SaaS tools themselves? Or how do you, is like, cause like, that's what I think of is like, AppSec is the SaaS tools themselves, it's the results, but are you somehow synthesizing those and, and providing them at a product security layer different from what I would think of as SaaS tools for someone who's doing AppSec? We are. Is it okay to mention yeah. like, products we use to explain yeah, this? that's yeah. fine. Okay. So we use GitHub yeah. Advanced Security. We use CodeQL scanning. It's part of our GitHub actions. Um, it just, it happens. On a PR, it scans, right? So, um, but what we do with that is our developers obviously have access to that. It's right there for them. They have a security tab they can see. We also use Dependabot in GitHub Advanced Security for SCA functionality. But then we have a tool that we, we have those results right there for the developers. We have a tool that takes those results and pretty much integrates them into other scan results like endpoint scanning, container scanning, and provides a view for everyone of these are your vulnerabilities. You can dig down into the vulnerabilities from there, but it gives you a great overview of, hey, engineering director, here are your five apps and look, these are your criticals that are past due. You know, these are vulnerabilities that you guys probably should take a look at, you know, those kind of things. So it's there for them to look at. Um, and we've had a great response from that. People really love that. First of all, they love seeing it all together. But second of all, they love just being able to see it because so often it's hidden from them. You know, with all of, we have all these tools on the security side, showing that all to them, making them look at four different tools is not realistic. They don't have enough time to do that. So showing it on one tool mm -hmm. is really where we've landed. And Jay is like a major product owner and architect of that. So I feel like he should probably be talking about that more than me. But it, it came from his but, brain. It's good stuff. Well, I can't, I, I can't take credit for it. I think it comes down to, I was at um, ISC Squared uh, Security Congress some years ago, and Kurt Lieber, who was, uh, I think, CISO for Aetna at the time, had got up and named and shamed a bunch of vendors. And this was like after WannaCry or NotPetya, and he's just like, 
you know, I'm sick and tired of this vendor sort of like lock in, you know, you guys are charging me more for APIs. And he was really kind of pushing the idea of going through and connecting your security tools to create tools that didn't exist in the marketplace for the needs of the business in order to do sort of more automated risk management. Is because we're sitting around and have a tabletop, you know, like we do for a tabletop and you call me and I call somebody else who's really talking about ransomware. He's like, I've already lost all of my assets, right? After someone's made a third phone call. And so for us, what I noticed looking at sort of traditional security is that we had all this sort of, you know, security reports, pen test reports that aren't really being shared often with developers. Developers don't know when sometimes when pen testing happens, you know, they don't know, they don't have access to the tools themselves. I wouldn't expect them to have access to these various security tools, but it's kind of really hard to talk about optimizing for people and democratizing security if we're not giving people information. What de developers are used to is having a tight feedback loop, right? I go look at my logs, you know, I go look at my tests if I'm developing something, if I'm doing test-driven development or repl-driven development, whatever it is, you're used to that constant feedback. But in security, here we have until recently, in the last couple of years, right? I had less of that. I got to go through, I got to log into Veracode and I got to understand that UI and blah, 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 blah. They got to come back somewhere else. How do we get you the information that you need without you having to look at a thousand different screens? You just want to know what is the problem, right? Where is it within uh, my source code, right? And maybe even some suggestions on how to fix it and so on and so forth. So for us, okay, great. That helps with developers. But you have the exact same thing for your SREs, exact same thing for your DBAs, exact same thing for all these various roles in addition to your product owners who want to know about, hey, am I complying with policy? Am I, you know, how many criticals do I have? How much maintenance time should I be sort of baking into my sprints? You know, should I just have a maintenance only sprint? Well, you don't know that if you don't really have an understanding of sort of what your vulnerabilities are, right, what your risks are. And... For us, it was very difficult to find something in the marketplace that made it easy for us to map our stuff back to our products, right? Um, the things that we report to the street was a publicly traded company. Um, even mapping back, let's say, revenue, right? Which is really important. You know, if I go sit down with leadership and say, hey, I think we have a problem here, it helps for me to be able to talk in the language of the business. Hey, here's a product that makes us money. And there's also some really critical vulnerabilities in it with a high likelihood of being exploited. Do we see that this is a potential problem, depending upon sort of, you know, how much sensitive data is there and again, how much revenue is at play? So you have to have a more meaningful conversation. Otherwise, we're setting up developers for failure. You know, we're selling up our engineers for failure. We're also setting up our, our security team for failure. You know, I was just at, I had a speaking engagement uh, yesterday. And so one of the things that we don't talk about enough is how much does doing security wrong cost our organizations. We very we talk in CBSS scores, we talk in CVEs and CWE and blah, 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 blah. We don't talk about is, okay, great, so-and-so got popped. How much did it cost them? Mm. You know, loss fines, class action settlements. So that's one of the places that we're trying to go next with our program is mapping this back to sort of the data that cyber insurers will have to say, okay, great. Yes, we knew it was a critical, but let's say you have, I don't know, 10 criticals, 20 highs. I don't, it depends on the size of your organization. Which one do you work on first? You know, especially yeah. if it looks like they're kind of similar. You know, we need some other way to do vulnerability management or vulnerability remediation better. Um, and it starts there and having that product security, you know, systems thinking um, point of view. And far too often, I think we, because application security usually gets started with like a single developer is really passionate. We kind of like nerd out on the technical details of particular issues as opposed to thinking about like, what is the actual risk to our customers and to the company as a whole? In order to do so, you kind of have to pull yourself out of just thinking about a single application. If you only got one application in your company, I get it. But if you got a bunch of them, you got to, you know, and or you have multiple applications that make up a, a product, probably should think about, you know, figuring out a way to communicate that stuff in a way that's going to have a product owner say, oh, okay, I, I see what you're saying there. Okay, what help do you need from me? You know, and, and you know, say, uh, I would say also be ready to have those same sort of conversations with other people within your organization. So, you know, again, not some idea that we came up with. I would, Justin Collins has talked about this stuff. Kurt Lieber's talked about this stuff. There's a lot of people who've talked about these things and we were just lucky to have a cross disciplinary team to kind of work on it and start building out, you know, tying our tools together to 
to really sort of focus on these particular issues. Yeah, and it seems like a good uh, – it's, it's, it's the right strategy. It's the right way forward is, you know, you've mentioned business results a couple of different times, and that needs to be part of the conversation, right? Like we don't just do security because we love security, which we all do. That's why we do this. But that doesn't, that doesn't make money for the business. Like it's a business function that we need. We need to think like business people. Like the, the security people that rise to the highest levels are the ones that think like business people. They're not the smartest technical people. They're the ones that understand how businesses work and how can we how can we align with the business so we're not a friction point, but we're a we're a we're, we generate value for the business. Yeah. That's we the have key. to. 100% because what happens, I can tell you how many friends with an application security say, I am the only application security person. They're extremely great technically, right? They know the ins and outs of it. They can go back and recite OWASP, ASVS, you know, line by line as an example, or a testing guide and so on and so forth. They're great. You know your stuff. But what happens is that person is like, oh, I'm going, this, I'm going through all this stuff. I got 50 developers. The company's grown. I got 100 developers. I'm the only application security person. I can't get any help. And it's like, well, what's happening here? The problem is, is that it's a failure to communicate in the language of the mm. business and everybody else. We're so focused on the technical details. And yeah, you're doing great work. But in order for you not to, you know, end up with some uh, security nihilism and kind of saying all the, the, the same sort of things that we complain about in the security world, you're going to need to grow a team. You're going to need some additional resources. You're going to need that tool. And if you can't have that sort of conversation, you're going to find yourself in a situation like, like, you know, I started out with a team of one, me, you know, um, and we grew from there. And so I had to kind of sort of evolve my thinking in order to, you know, bring on awesome people like, you know, Daryl and the rest of our team. Yeah, and we kind of, we, we've kind of already talked around the edges of this, the next question, the next direction I want to go. I want to talk about communicating vulnerabilities throughout the organization to senior leaders and engineers, because I think that's an important piece of what we need to do as security professionals coming back around to understanding the business, right? Proper communication, soft skills, those types of things that allow us to communicate what the real challenges are in a way that the business person or the product owner understands is how we truly unlock value. So Darlin, <coughs> excuse me, what's been your experience here in, in the communication side? Um, I've had not so much where we're at right now at Cover My Meds, but I've had some experience at other companies where I have had to um, go into a VP's weekly staff meeting and explain to him, this is what it is, you know, and I think the most important part there is we can do that. We're his security resource. Like I'm his SME. He needs me to be able to clearly explain to him not in technical terms, but in business terms, what's going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I think that's one of the skills we develop in product security. It's one of the things like uh, Jay and I were just recently talking about when you're a developer, you're working with peers and your direct manager. When you're working in security, you're working with management and even upper management even possibly sea level, depending on what your role is. And you need to learn to talk to them so that they understand you don't want to waste their time. They've got a lot to do. Um, they have things that they need to worry about that are not you. But uh, you need to be able to get them the information they need. Um, and is it a list of vulnerabilities? Probably not. That is probably not useful for them. Is it um, a we do something called a state of security report. Is it a state of security report where your engineering teams are reporting that your security is in a good state? And this is what that means. These three things are what that means. Or your, your developers are telling me this is why. You know, those are the kind of things they want to hear. They don't want to hear, oh, we have this, you know, critical thing over here in this that that is very technical and not useful for them. They're just going to say, go talk to the engineering manager anyway. So um, I, I feel like I kind of wandered away from your question a little bit there. But I think that some of it comes back to security is about people and security is about people communicating. And that's a, a, a 
piece that we have to be able to do as security professionals, we have to be able to communicate to people who don't do things like us. Um, so I think that comes in vulnerability management. It comes in when we're talking about resources, it comes in when we have um, questions, you know, your director has a question about something, you know, he doesn't want the technical details. He wants to know what it is so that he understands it and can tell his boss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what I've seen is, especially in the C-level, C-level executives are risk people at the end of the day. <laughs> they just care about, so what's the risk to me, to my, my functional area of the business? I could, they could care less about the, the technical details of the latest vulnerability. Like, don't even go there because they're, if they don't rudely tell you to stop talking, they'll just glaze over <laughs> and pick up their phone and start <laughs> doing something else. Cause they're like, I just don't, this is not information I need in my head. Um, and so it just comes down to, to knowing that audience and, and being able to put it in a, make it a risk-based conversation. Like if, so here's the problem. If we don't do this, then here is the risk to the business. And, and, and oftentimes that's enough for them. And they may, then they'll start locking into, okay, let's explore some more about what that, that risk is that you're talking about here. How much is that going to, what, what's the potential monetary damages, reputational damages? What are the, what are the things that could go wrong here? And that's when they can make a decision because now they're, now you're speaking their language and that's the key. It's just speaking their language. They don't just don't talk technical, talk about the business need the business function, the business result that we're all trying to get to. All right. So let's do the lightning round here. It is, it is, we've reached that time. Normally this is Robert's segment, but I'm filling in today. So I apologize in advance. I'm not going to be as good at the lightning round as he is, but, um, but you're, we're going to, we're going to do this. So um, let's see, Daryl, and we're going to come to you first and then we'll ping pong back and forth. So, we love to hear people's most controversial opinion on application security. And so what is your most, most controversial opinion on AppSec and why do you hold this view? You know, it's interesting because thinking about that earlier, I'm like, I'm not a controversial person, you know, <laughs> but I do have a lot of strongly held opinions. So um, I'm going to tell you the most important person in my work world is not Jay, who's my boss, or even our VP. It's my developers. For my role and what I do, it is my security champions. So if my director is pinging me about something and one of my security champions is pinging about something, I'm going to the security champion first. The director can wait. I know sometimes people don't like to operate that way, but literally, though, I can't live without those people. They are my priority. Hmm. Okay. Jay, how about you? Most controversial opinion on AppSec and why do you hold this view? I, I got a lot about security. So I'm going to just, I mean, hey, I can, I, can, I can talk about this for a while. I'm going to say, so here's one that we need to talk about more. A lot of penetration, web app, web app penetration testing is crap. Let's just be absolutely honest. A lot of web app penetration testing is crap. So let's say it a second time. A lot of web app, web app penetration testing is crap for the third time. So, I mean, here's the thing, right? So some of the stuff you're going to do from compliance perspective, right? I got to go through and demonstrate per client contract or whatever it is, you know, that I'm doing this. But if we want to get something that is valuable for uh, us, then we need to move away from sort of this black box, gray box testing, and we need to get into something where we're just sort of opening stuff up and starting to get into some of the business logic issues. I think that's really important because those are the things that are, in most cases, are going to be exploited. If your web app penetration testing team, or this internal, or it's an agency, there's no way you're just clicking a button and seeing what comes back, which is what happens probably in the majority of cases out there. Um, we're not getting a whole lot of bang for your buck besides being able to check off the box of compliance. Mm -hmm. And so I would say is um, I get it. In those instances, but I think there is an opportunity for us to talk a little bit more about how to help, you know, uh, you know, those vendors and, um, you know, that that domain of security 
sort of, you know, uh, be better for all of us. Um, cause I, I think it can be very beneficial, but, um, but 2023, a lot of it ain't great. Yeah. Yeah. You, we could have a whole episode discussion just on that one. Cause I agree with you wholeheartedly. So it would be us kind of trashing <laughs> the, the, the state of the industry, but I don't, but I don't, I don't mind doing that either. But, uh, so we should have a follow up conversation on that. Cause that's a, that's a fun topic and, uh, people tend to, People to this day, they still lead with the pen test. Oh, you got to do a pen test. But you've never run a SAS tool against your code base. So or, or so, what are you going to find with a pen test is just going to find a bunch of things you could have ran a scanner to find the first yeah. time around. Like that's the that's the challenge. Yeah. But we'll, we'll keep that for another. We'll, we'll do another episode where we'll we'll unpack that one. We'll spend a whole hour just on that one topic and we'll, we'll make a lot of people happy on the Internet. So, Jay, I'm going to go to you first with the second one, just because that way Daryl doesn't have to go first on all of these uh, billboard message. Say we, we, we were going to we gave you a billboard at RSA or Black Hat conference. And so you've got a limited amount of space. But what would be a, the one, a message you would want to get to our entire industry? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, optimize, uh, first one, optimize for people, you know, share your security results, reports, findings with your engineers. They love feedback. They love feedback. Tighten the feedback loop. So maybe first one, optimize for people, tighten the feedback loop, sentences, boom, boom, boom. Share your results with your engineers so they can actually fix stuff. I like it. All right, Daryl, how about you? Um, I'm going to go with just collaborate. I get really tired of um, people thinking security people are mean and they don't want to work with you. I want to work with you. I want to work. I don't care who you are. I want to work with you. So collaboration is key in creating a security culture. I, I never want somebody to think that I don't have time for them or that they're not important. So I'm mm, good. The time and I'm going to listen to their problem and then uh, collaborate with them to try to find an answer. Excellent. All right, Daryl, how about you be our first answer on the, the last question in the lightning round here? What's your top book recommendation and why do you find it valuable? And just as a caveat, this doesn't have to be a security book. Like most people have answered this outside the realm of security because there's so many good things, but it can be a security book too. So I am not a big technical book reader. Okay. Um, I read a lot uh, of smaller sources. I'm not a big technical book reader. I'm a fiction book reader. So I'm going to tell you anything Kristen Hanna writes. Fabulous. You might want to buy your wife that for Christmas, like a Kristen Hanna book. There you go. That's excellent. This will be our first ever Christmas gift recommendation on the application nice. security podcast after 250 episodes. So I have to, I'll have to, I'll have to track that go down. wrong. I'll track that down. That's my, my wife is a big reader, so I'll have to, uh, and she doesn't listen to the podcast either, which is just kind of funny, but, um, Jay, how about you? What's a, what's a, a, a top book recommendation that you would make for the audience? Yeah. I'm looking at my, my bookshelves and there's just so many, I guess the one that I've quoted a lot, um, lately it is a security book. Um, is uh, How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risk by Doug Hubbard and Rich Syerson, which I think more people need to read. I'm a little uh, ashamed that I didn't actually read this book until this year. And I was like, oh, here's someone who kind of agrees with my opinion and then has done a lot of work on that risk quantification side. So I think it's awesome because I think when you start off in security, it's very easily, easy just to talk about security without rec rec recognizing that, as you said earlier, security is just a component of risk. Right. And as you need to have conversations with people and help them sort of understand security, it's kind of sometimes easier to do that and just having a conversation about risk, because then we can take that and tell really great stories about stuff like, hey, you know, working on your home or something like that. Hey, I got a hole in my roof or I live in a rough neighborhood. I want to secure it. People get the risk conversation. Sometimes they don't necessarily get, you know, security and application security sort of things until it's 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 within that risk framework. And I think that book helps with it a ton. Excellent. All right, Daryl Lynn, how about key takeaway and call to, or a call to action? Is there something you want our audience to do as a result of our conversation, or do you want to just leave them with a key takeaway? The floor is yours. 
I just want our AppSec engineers to think broader, to think more than AppSec, still do all your AppSec things, but start thinking about your influence in your organization and broaden it so that you can have a more secure product instead of just some secure applications. Excellent. So Jay, how about you? A final thought. Yeah, on a similar note, that was a really great point, Darren. I would say stop throwing stuff over the wall. Just don't, 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 don't do that. What I mean by that is, kind of getting back to the influence part. If you're a you know security manager, security leader, you know just even an IC, right? So your application security engineer. Um, at some point in time, we have to kind of listen to the why behind why things may not necessarily be happening the way that you want them to happen. I get sick and tired of all oh, these stupid engineers, all oh, these stupid developers. If they just did this, when we should be maybe walking into HR and saying, hey, these, like, these people just need more developers on their team. They got a ton of applications. They need some help, right? Um, we need to be a part of that conversation and helping them address the underlying issues. Maybe they just don't have the information. Maybe you guys aren't get, getting them real-time vulnerability information and they don't get it, get it till too late. You know, maybe you need to work on integrating some of these security tools into CI, CD. Maybe that's the real issue. And as they get it, then I'll work on it. Maybe you don't fully understand risk. So stop throwing stuff over the wall and kind of just pointing fingers, right? It's, it's you're in a team environment. Let's focus on the team and, uh, you know, help them help be advocates for your engineers, mm -hmm. especially with legal and finance and leadership so that they can go through and accomplish the goals that, the organization has so i think that's a good team. place to lead this conversation team. is be advocates for your engineers um yeah. it's, it's just really good advice and so th this episode's been been we've, we've had good advice from from both of you sprinkled throughout this entire episode so um this is this has been great to get your perspective as practitioners who are in the in the moment in that you're in the mix I always love to talk to people who are not theorizing, but are actually, we're doing this. We we did this. We did that. Like that's, it's just such a great perspective. So thanks for coming on the show, for sharing your perspectives. And we look forward to a, uh, a future episode where we'll unpack something else in the realm of AppSec or ProdSec. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Chris. Thanks.